ABNC, America's Black News Channel. Watch 15 minutes. Share with everyone. Finally, news that speaks to us. We turn our attention once again to the case of Melissa Lucio, a woman who's been living on death row in Texas for more than a decade. Melissa was convicted of murdering her two-year-old daughter, Mariah, and sentenced to death back in 2008, with her execution date set for next month. Police say Melissa confessed to killing her daughter during a seven-hour police interrogation, saying, quote, I guess I did it. But Lucio's attorney says she made a false confession given the circumstances and because she's a victim of abuse. The Marshall Project took an in-depth look at false confessions and why abuse survivors and trauma victims like Melissa are more likely to confess to crimes they didn't commit. I've got Maurice Shama here, a staff writer with the Marshall Project and author of the book, Let the Lord Sort Them, The Rise and Fall of the Death Penalty. Also with us is Lucy Granira, a psychologist at the University of Virginia School of Medicine who has studied false confessions. I appreciate you both for coming on tonight. Maurice, starting with you, it, it, listen, it's hard for people to understand why anyone would confess to a crime they didn't do. But your article looked at why people like Melissa confess to crimes that they're innocent of. Give us a, an overview of what you found in your research on false confessions. Sure, you're right. It's something that I think surprises a lot of people. I've been looking at false confessions for more than a year, and there are even times where I think, you know, yeah, but but I would never, you know, confess to a crime I didn't commit. Um, but when you watch these uh, videos of people being interrogated, you know, there are almost like physical sensations that you can sort of imagine having in these scenarios where the interrogator is really getting up into your space. Uh, they're lying to you, which will lead you to uh, kind of question your own sense of reality and your own sense of memory. Um, and then they're also threatening and coercing you with claims like, you know, if you don't confess to this crime, you're never going to see your kids again. This is something Melissa Lucio says she was told. Um, or, you know, uh, if you don't confess, then prosecutors are going to throw the book at you and you're going to get the death penalty. Of course, in Melissa Lucio's case, she got the death penalty anyway. But uh, in these cases, you know, eventually people crack. And for Melissa Lucio, it happened, uh, you know, around 3 a.m. She'd spent seven hours in the interrogation room uh, with uh, police and, uh, you know, a series of interrogators. And I think we'd all like to believe it wouldn't happen to us. But the reality is that uh, it can, and people who have uh, past trauma, past domestic violence in their lives, uh, we're now learning have particular vulnerability in this situation. Lucy, can you give us an overview of the statistics on false confession confessions? I mean, how often does this happen, and specifically with black and brown suspects? Yes, so um, there are, uh, it's, it's certainly true that most confessions that are obtained by police are likely true confessions. But the rates of false confessions are still significant and problematic when you think about the huge numbers of individuals who are interrogated each year, um, particularly um, disproportionate numbers of racial and ethnic minorities. Um, so if you look at proven um, DNA exonerations, somewhere around a quarter of those um, false confessions were one of the aspects leading to the exoneration, um, or the false, the false conviction and ultimately exoneration. Um, and if you look at some survey data, you can get numbers up to 10 to 15% of interrogated juveniles um, say that they made a false confession at various points. Well, Maurice, let's talk about Melissa's case. Um, she had been interrogated for several hours. She was tired, she was hungry and pregnant. Um, so she felt coerced and she felt pressured. And given her history with abusive men, she felt afraid by the male officers who were antagonizing her. So talk about how often women confess because they fear for their safety. Well, Melissa, Melissa Lucio was like a lot of women uh, who have trauma in their past. You know, they've been with an abusive boyfriend or husband or had a stepfather or father who was abusive. And um, the way it's been described to me is that there's something called sort of learned helplessness or a sense that uh, uh, if you acquiesce to male authority figures, you're going to be physically safer. You're less likely to, to um, you know, be hurt in the future by them. And once the... Um, a woman like Melissa gets into the interrogation room, that fear, uh, it really sort of ratchets up. And so on the one hand, you may be afraid that if you implicate uh, your boyfriend or husband um, and say that they are the one who actually committed the crime, that they're going to, you know, come after you. 
Uh, on the other hand, it may be that the interrogator sort of, in a sense, reminds you of uh, the abusive partner. And it's not that they're really going to hurt you, but you sort of perceive that they are, because every time you're being berated and lied to and shouted at, uh, that's usually what follows. And you've kind of learned to acquiesce, to say yes, basically, um, even if it's not true, in order to get out of the situation. There's a desperation that can set in. Uh, in the case of Melissa Lucio, uh, they brought in a doll, a plastic doll that was supposed to mimic uh, her child. Mo uh, Melissa had uh, claimed that her daughter, uh, Mariah, had fallen down a staircase, uh, but after these hours of interrogation, mm -hmm. when she finally broke, she demonstrated basically spanking the doll at the behest of uh, an interrogator, a Texas Ranger, who would hit the doll and then hand it to Melissa and have her sort of repeat his actions in a way that um, her lawyers now say is tantamount to sort of coercion and gaslighting. And from my understanding, uh, Melissa never physically abused any of her children. There's no evidence that she did beyond her own confession. Uh, you know, her other children have yeah. said that she did not hit any of them. Um, and another daughter actually said that she had seen the child fall down the stairs. Uh, so, you know, the, and, and I should also say that what Melissa admitted to was hitting the child, not to killing the child, but these admissions were then brought into court by prosecutors who kind of spun it as, uh, mm -hmm. well, she confessed to hitting the child, so that means that she you know, confessed to actually killing her, and, and that's not what she said. Um, but you know, there's sort of a failure at multiple stages in this case where uh, the truth was kind of you know, pulled out and manipulated. Lucy, uh, research that you and others have done found that one of the main reasons pe people make false confessions is the aggressive nature of police interrogations. One of the detectives who interrogated Melissa said um, that her lack of eye contact and her slumped posture indicated to him that she was hiding something. But research shows that behavior could also that behavior could also indicate past trauma. What are some of the telltale signs that someone may be an abuse victim and therefore more likely to make a false confession? Yeah, so this is a, a huge issue. Um, the, the path that leads to a false confession really starts before the interrogation. Um, so, you know, police will say something along the lines of, we don't, we only interrogate guilty suspects. That means before the formal interrogation starts, there's this uh, kind of fact-finding behavioral lie detection section where um, police are kind of feeling out whether they think the individual is being truthful or not. And they're using these behavioral lie detection techniques like looking at eye contact, looking at slouching, um, looking at someone's rate of speech, looking at fidgeting, all of these things um, that people may presume indicate guilt, but research continually shows um, are not very strong predictors one way or the other. Basically, we think we're better at um, uh, uh, figuring out whether people are lying than we, we actually are. Um, and um, like you said, this, this can put people with post-traumatic symptoms at greater risk for a false confession because a lot of these same behaviors that are presumed to indicate guilt um, can actually be post-traumatic symptoms. So people with post-traumatic mm -hmm. symptoms um, uh, are prone to overreact to situations because of a, um, a hyper-aroused threat detection system. Um, so they may be hypervigilant. They may be looking for... Um, looking around for danger, they may startle easily. These all may see, make them seem like they are nervous because they're guilty. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, um, people with post-traumatic symptoms can also um, seem sort of underreactive. They can dissociate or they can have emotional numbing where they seem disconnected, they don't care. This can also come across as potentially guilty behavior um, uh, to police. And so um, the problem is that there really, there really aren't um, sort of telltale signs that you could give you know, a list to police officers and they would be able to tell this person has post-traumatic symptoms and this person doesn't. Um, so it's sort of a, it's, it's kind of a hidden mm -hmm. problem that um, uh, police are unlikely to be aware of um, and therefore unlikely to respond correctly to. Maurice, let's talk about solutions. I mean, police are legally allowed to lie to suspects, but there are some states that have already passed laws to prevent uh, police from lying to people during interrogations. And other states like New York are exploring similar laws. What can you tell us about these legislations and their effectiveness? 
Uh, it's hard to know whether they're effective because they're fairly new. You know, um, it'll be years, if not decades, before we can really see whether there's a decline in um, false confessions and exonerations. And the, the tricky thing about, I think, this entire area is that we're sort of only know the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there have been uh, several thousand exonerations since the 1980s, uh, between two and 300 of those of women. Um, but we don't know ultimately how many innocent people are in prison, how many innocent people have falsely confessed to crimes that are still serving time. Um, that said, states are starting to take uh, you know, measures to try to prevent uh, this sort of tragedy from happening. So Illinois and Oregon have passed laws that ban um, lying specifically to adolescent suspects, to teenagers, uh, anyone under 18 who's a suspect in a case. Other states are trying to improve uh, the, you know, kind of improve upon the rights of, of teenagers, uh, saying they have, you know, a, a stronger right to a lawyer and to have their uh, parents or guardian contacted. Um, so these are the first, the first types of laws, and they're mostly around uh, people under 18. But there's a few states, including New York, that are thinking about going even further and are and have bills on the table that would uh, ban all lying to um, to suspects in the interrogation room. And this wouldn't necessarily prevent police from using a range of other coercive techniques. But lying is this one sort of clean policy line that you can draw in order to try to start to sort of address the problem. Um, another thing that many states have been doing, you know, I think uh, a number of states have laws on the books now that just require us to record interrogations so that we almost, you know, know what we're dealing with. I mean, part of the fact that uh, in the Melissa Lucio case, you know, Lucy and I are able to, to sit here and, and, and analyze it, is that the interrogation was recorded, and that's not true in every state. So um, I think there's going to be a movement uh, continuing to uh, get police just to record these interrogations so that if something went wrong, if there's a potential for a false confession, lawyers and psychologists and journalists like me can go in later and really, you know, um, parse the details of what happened in that interrogation room, because otherwise it's really a black box. Maurice Shama with the Marshall Project and psychologist Lucy Guanera, thank you both for your time and insight tonight. Appreciate it.